Let's welcome in our next guest. Uh, you know, of course, that uh, Alex Mooney, the congressman from the 2nd Congressional District, decided that he would run for Senate. And that created the scramble because now there's an open seat and a domino effect as well. So with that open seat, we've had a few people throw uh, their hats in the ring for that 2nd Congressional District seat, one of which is Alex Gasserud, who joins us via telephone. Good morning, Alex. Thank you for being with us. Hey, good morning, uh Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. You're on with Rob and with Bill. And first and foremost, let's talk a little bit about you, uh, who you are, and how you got to this point. Give us the Alex Gasserud story. Absolutely. So I'm a 30-year-old uh, West Virginian, born and raised. Um, I was born and raised in Elkins, West Virginia, which is Randolph County. Uh, and I graduated high school in 2010, got a political science degree from a liberal arts college, Davis and Elkins College. Uh, in 2015, and I've been in the private sector ever since. So I've always felt, a, since I was a kid, I've always felt a calling to service. And uh, with the state of the country and with the state of West Virginia in general, I, I think now is a good time to step up and to start to lead people into better outcomes in the state of West Virginia uh, and, and put people's interests first, because I believe we've been in a state for as long as I've been alive where special interests have taken the front seat Political interest is taking the front seat, and the people's interest is taking the back seat. And we see that with a lot of the outcomes we have currently in West Virginia. Let's talk about third-party logistics, where you uh, more or less kind of began your career after college. Tell us about that job. Absolutely. So after college, I uh, wanted to get it right into politics, but I thought that a little premature. I thought I needed to go out into the real world and prove myself, and uh, I got a career going in third-party logistics. And I've, I've been in that career ever since uh, graduating from college. I call on companies that have full truckloads of any product you could imagine, uh, loads that uh, are refrigerated, dry goods and products that go on flatbed equipment, uh, anything you could think of, anything you buy, anything you see, anything you touch. It got there typically at first via truck. Uh, and and I've, I've been in that business. It's very rewarding. I call on these companies, get them to give me their full truckload. And then I make a margin. I find a carrier in the open market for, for less than what the customer gives me the load to move for. So on the front lines in transportation, uh, and it, it has been an interesting career so far, especially with the pandemic taking place. And Alex, let's talk about your decision to run for the House of Representatives. Have you run for office before? No, not a current office holder, uh, nor have I run for public office in the past. Um, of what you would consider a newer generation of, of leader. Uh, I'm not entangled with any sort of special interests or D.C. Uh, I'm, I'm completely, you know, uh, you know, pure in that sense. And uh, this this is my first run, and we're excited to run. So it's, it's been a good start. Yeah. Alex, uh, Bill Stubblefield, uh, why did you decide to jump in the race for the uh, for uh, U.S. Congress as opposed to doing the more traditional uh, evolution of running for the state delegate or state senate? Hey, great question, Bill. First answer is I'm looking for full-time work. I'm looking to represent the people of West Virginia 365 days, 24-7. Uh, obviously, the legislature is, is more of a part-time position, uh, as we know. And I find that I have a skill set where I can bring immediate impact and results for the people of West Virginia try to help get the country back on track as well as the state of West Virginia. Have you had the opportunity to talk to Alex Mooney, um, our current um, uh, U.S. Rep uh, U.S. congressman? No, I have not spoken with mm -hmm. Alex Mooney yet. Um, you know, I, I, I like the way Alex voted uh, through his time in Congress, uh, but I also believe he's been an absentee congressman for the most part. He's never passed any consequential or any legislation at all for the people of West Virginia. And I talked to countless voters and all the counties that I've toured so far and, and other people around the state. And they, they're saying this is the first time they've seen Alex Mooney. And the only reason they're seeing him is because he's running the U.S. Senate campaign. So he's also endorsed my opponent. Uh, and, and I wish Alex you know, luck in his next, next endeavor. I'm, I'm glad that uh, he's no longer going to be serving the 2nd Congressional District. I've looked at your platform, and some of your platforms are uh, obviously uh, – uh, appropriate for a U.S. Congress. Others, though, are more state-focused. For example, yeah. uh, lower tax, uh, lower state income tax, 10% immediately. Uh, the federal government has nothing to do at all with lowering our state taxes. Why are you including this in your platform? 
Yeah, so just because I'm seeking a federal office and would be representing people at the federal level doesn't mean I'm not going to be involved in helping uh, push the state forward and, and working with local politicians at the local level, the county level, and the state level is going to be well within my purview as my duties in Congress. Um, you know, again, Congress really only works half a year anyway. Uh, so I'm going to be focused on helping local and, and county officials as well as state lawmakers to create the better outcomes that we need in the state, uh, specifically on income tax uh, and, and a whole host of other issues, whether it's education uh, or it's DHHR. I think we need a forceful voice to, to lead on some of these issues. And, and, and while my, my work at the federal level won't be compromised by it, I think it's important that I help lead uh, on the state level as well and the local level. So, so as I interpret what you say, you'll have your, your federal job as a U.S. congressman, but then you'll get very, you'll get, you'll remain very active on statewide issues as well. Is that correct? Exactly. I, I will be, I will be active in all facets of, of West Virginia politics. Exactly. And do you, yep. do you think they'll be well received by our, our uh, state senators and state delegates? Potentially not. Um, or potentially, that depends on what kind of conversations they want to have as far as pushing the state forward. You know, the, the West Virginia legislature, I'm sure you guys are aware, doesn't have the greatest track record historically. And uh, it's going to take all of us to get on board and to collaborate and to cooperate to create better outcomes. Because the reality is six out of 55 counties are growing. We're missing a key age demographic of young people, 18 to 34 years old. And we're about to lose our second generation of them. Uh, coming up here. So we've got to get together now and fix a lot of these issues. I'm sure you know the, the failed education system that we currently have. Luckily, in Berkeley County, uh, we just got some educational scores from, from the Eastern Panhandle, and, and in Berkeley County, they're good. You know, people are, you know, kids are, are, are much more proficient in reading and literacy than we see around the other parts of the state. So, you know, it's going to take all of us to work together, uh, whether we're congressman, senator, governor, or we're in the House of Delegates, or we're a local county mayor or commissioner. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, Rob asked you before, had you run for office, uh, and you have not. Uh, but earlier in your campaign, were you? Con I thought you were considering running for governor. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, in the summertime, I did uh, officially file with the Secretary of State's office to run for governor. Um, I had gotten reading the Constitution and uh, there was a little bit of a residency dispute. And uh, there was a, a case that had happened previously um, with a residency challenge. And the Secretary of State's office, when they send you the form to pre-file for governor, uh, there's no question on that form that asks you, how long have you been a resident of West Virginia? I mean, I'm a lifelong West Virginia. I'm a native West Virginia, but I did leave the state temporarily uh, for, for different work. And... I, I gave up my residency. So, so that was more or less just to kind of get some attention coming out of nowhere, but also uh, to you know, expose a, a hole in the system as far as the filing process is concerned. So there, there's a different residency requirement for um, uh, U.S. Congress than what there is for governor then. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The okay. state constitution uh, is describing you must be a resident of the state for five consecutive years. Uh, the United States Constitution uh, states you just have to live of the state that you are running for that you're representing okay. or attempting to represent. Also, the uh, uh, running for the House representative is less crowded right now than running for governor. Yes, and I think that I have the ability to be the governor of West Virginia. Don't get me wrong, but I think it's a little bit too big of a step right now, and it's a very expensive campaign as well. It's a lot more expensive than, say, a congressional campaign is going to be. And I think it would be more appropriate for me to go fight on the national level now as well because of the way we're losing the country. Uh, you mentioned cost, and cost is a real consideration. Uh, do you? Who are your sponsors? I currently don't have any endorsements or any sponsors. I, I, I do have donors, people that, mm -hmm. that donate. I'm, I'm on the phone every day calling uh, around the country, just not in the state of West Virginia, that you know, spreading our message and uh, you know, raising money from Republicans that – that, that help candidates, mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't have any any sponsors. I'm not quite sure what that is, and I'm not sure either. I should <laughs> should have said. Uh, Thinking about donors, uh, donors, uh, packs, and the like. Packs, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yes, I, yeah, that's all public information. You can you can see that on the uh, you can see that in, in the FEC filings. Um, we're we're actively raising money right now. Uh, you know, the, last year uh, there was 19 billion dollars spent on the 2022 elections, which is just ridiculous amounts of money for politics, in my opinion. Um, and and people were a little hungover. You know, I, I talked to a to a lot of a lot of donors that. You know, we're saying it's a little early. I'm keeping my powder dry, and, and and some that are saying, sure, I'll donate, but probably wouldn't donate right now. What I, you know, do what I or what what I did last uh, last cycle. So, Alex, uh, let me jump in here a second yeah. here, Bill, just to get to a couple of other things as well. Uh, you describe yourself as a pragmatist who will work to get the job done for all West Virginians, regardless of party affiliation. Give me an idea. And in regards to pragmatism, and uh, does that necessarily mean compromise as well? If you're a pragmatist, compromise is a, is a you know, consensus is the absence of leadership. Margaret Thatcher said that, and and I do agree with that. But I also think that we need to cooperate and we need to get involved. As I was speaking to earlier, uh, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to make sure that I'm creating solutions to bring the best outcomes to my to my district to the, to the people of west virginia and to the people of the country uh, so yes there, there could be situations where i would be you know obviously pragmatic and, and, and make sure we're cooperating to get the job done but at the same time i'm not going to be betraying the interests of of west virginians like we see our current federal representatives doing so you know yes but i, I do want to be clear that uh, i'm also going to be making sure we're doing the right thing uh as opposed to what, you know, consensus is. Compromise has become an evil word among the fringes of both parties. Right. Uh, and that's why government's not working. Is it, is it, uh, uh, let me back that up. Is government not working because of compromise or because it's being regarded as an evil word by the fringes of both parties? We're more ideological than we've ever been. Well, you know, the country is very polarized politically. And, it's important that in that rage of polarization, we are not hurting people. And, and you know, in the same, in the, in the other hand, we're not seeing results that are getting accomplished for the American people. You know, there isn't a lot of compromise in D.C. There isn't bipartisan cooperation. And I, I do believe that a lot of that is because the Democrats specifically have run so far to the left and have have basically accepted this neo-Marxist doctrine and, and, and they want to erode Americans' freedom. So I, I would say it's because of the politics of the left that we're more polarized than any, than any time previously. But obviously there's a great deal of, of, of consternation on the, on the Republican side right now. You can see that in multifacets of, of political, you know, discourse and, and, and maneuvering. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit of both. The word, I want to go back to the word compromise again uh, and, and Republican. I've been a registered Republican since Ronald Reagan was president, and I'm, I know that was before you were born, but that, that's okay. I'm twice your age. <laughs> uh, and there was, a time, there was a time when I was considered a right-wing Republican. Yes. And now there are many who call me a rhino. Yeah. OK. And, and the word that caused that was compromise. Yeah. So tell me how, as a 30 year old who's an America first Republican, you can compromise. But lose the respect among Republicans who, as soon as you compromise, will call you a rhino. Well, again, one of the reasons I'm running for this office is. I'm not afraid to take on attacks like that. Um, I, I fought a lot worse as far as liberals are concerned, so I'm not too worried about what, what Republicans are going to do to me or try to say about me. They can, they can do that, and that's going to be their, their prerogative. Again, compromising, uh, getting back to that word, you know, I would be applying compromise selectively, and I would be doing it where it makes sense. I'm saying that I'm open to cooperating to get – results achieved for people. But I'm not going to go back on my principles. And, and most of the p policy positions I take are very conservative, whether it's aid to Ukraine or it's deploying the military to secure the border and forming a mass deportation task force, uh, or it's 
what's going on in the international stage. Like right now, I wouldn't be compromising with China in any way, shape, or form. I'd be very, very tough on them from trade policy to foreign policy. So, uh, again, compromise. I don't, we shouldn't get too caught up on that, but I'm definitely not going to be somebody that is closing my mind from an ideological standpoint and stopping good results, good things coming people's way. Bill? Yeah. What is your position on, you, on the Ukraine? Should we continue to support? No. Uh, well, we should not continue to support financially the way we are supporting. Uh, I do believe that getting them the proper resources and arms uh, is, is important, uh, but even that would be on a smaller scale. Uh, we're depleting some of our uh, already paid for military resources currently by sending them to U- Ukraine. Uh, the other problem with, with the United States and another reason I'm running is our debt. We are not able to help a country like Ukraine when our educational system has failed in the United States, when we have infrastructure problems that create catastrophes like we see in East Palestine and a whole other plethora of issues like, for instance, the taxpayer paying for illegal aliens to be put up in hotel rooms. Okay, just absolutely we are in no position to be sending blank checks and robust financial aid to Ukraine. I would immediately stop that financial aid to Ukraine and be a voice that thought adamantly about that. You mentioned East Palestine, uh, Ohio. Uh, what would you, what should we have done differently to prevent this derailment? Well, again, I, I'm not an, an expert here. I, you know, I, 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 I'm not a rail inspector. But from what I have read, from the research that I have done, and the conversations I've had with people, this was a preventable disaster. This was failure of maintaining the equipment and the track. Uh, and, and, and I'll wait, you know, I don't want to get too far into that. I'll wait for the final report and everything to come out. Um, but, you know, that's an issue. You know, our infrastructure is so dilapidated. We know that very well here in West Virginia. We actually rank, rank last in, in infrastructure in West Virginia. So. Following that line, then, uh, that with infrastructure needs and uh, to, to address that infrastructure uh, difficulties, uh, Senator Manchin was instrumental uh, last fall in getting a bipartisan bill through that would, and I've got uh, something with inflation. I'm not, I get hung up on the title, but basically put in a lot yeah, of money. The Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, a lot of uh, money is coming into West Virginia for infrastructure needs. Would you have supported that that act, that uh, that bill? No. Why not? No, I wouldn't have supported that bill. Uh, again, the federal government uh, is too bloated. It's too big. Uh, they, they renamed that infrastructure bill uh, to tie it to inflation to get more public support for it. It was heinously named. Um, It's another example of the federal government uh, overreaching as far as, you know, spending. Again, 31 plus trillion dollars. We're going to get pretty soon. We're going to be in a situation where we're going to have a hard time paying the interest on this debt in another 10, 20, 30 years. And and, and I think that 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 bill was filled with 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 waste. So, no, I, I would not have been voting for that infrastructure bill even though a a sizable amount would be coming back to West Virginia to address our infrastructure needs. Right. I'm a small government conservative. I'm not a, you know, big spending liberal. So, no, I I, I think that the the Inflation Reduction Act didn't do anything, like its title says, to to tame inflation. And I don't believe that uh, those dollars that are coming to West Virginia are going to be that impactful that, that we should have passed that. So, no, I was against the Inflation Reduction Act, as is most West Virginians. That's what was so disappointing about Joe Manchin voting for that bill. If you're uh, fortunate enough to be elected, uh, how do you view your capability of working with your colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle and also with the Senate? I, I'm perfectly capable of doing that. You know, I, I've got a background in debate. Um, I'm a student of politics. I've been studying politics and figures in in politics, world politics, since I was a kid. Uh, And I have, obviously, I've gone to school. I've gotten along with people that uh, ideologically are completely opposite of me, um, specifically in, in, in different classes, taking on liberals. So I don't think I'll have any problem at all relating in a, in a social way. I mean, 
I hate to say it, D.C. is not working for people right now, and there's a lot of special interests involved, so I'm going to be a different voice. But uh, I also know I'm going to have to get along a little bit to get results for the people of West Virginia. We're down to our final minute here, Bill, so I'm going to turn it back over to Alex. You've got uh, 30 seconds or so. Go ahead and address our audience. Hey, Rob, Bill, thanks for having me on. It's great to speak to the people of the Eastern Panhandle. Uh, I think there's a lot of great things happening in the Eastern Panhandle. We need to be shining a light on the Eastern Panhandle, and we need to be taking what's working there and applying it to the other parts of the state. Uh, You know, whether it's education or or other things, we also need to get locality pay. We have to start getting resources to the Eastern Panhandle. It's ridiculous that we're sending state troopers uh, to to stay in hotel rooms and to police communities uh, because they don't have proper proper law enforcement. So uh, we need to help the panhandle and really lead with the panhandle. It's the only county that grew double digits in the, it, from 2010 to 2020, and it's the second oldest county in the state of West Virginia. It needs to be put first. Alex, thank you so much. I appreciate your time this morning. Good luck to you, Have sir. Have a great day.